All right, let's go. We're live. Um, so yesterday I left you guys some problems to do. Uh, let's go through them. So one was to simplify. steps 
so you can't just guess an answer. I, I will mention a common mistake that I've seen with these guys in the past was someone doing something like this. So let me preface this with common mistake. Okay. So they're seeing this and they say, oh, well, the E and the LN cancel each other, right? And so I'm left with a negative 2. Why is that wrong? Yeah? Yeah, well, we already showed that, but why would this be incorrect? <laughs> What would tell you that that's something is off? What what indicates to you that that was? Negative, so I have to deal with some kind of reciprocal. One over two times. Sure, that's if you're doing it the correct way. But why doesn't this work? It's not the what? So this cancellation rule, do you, do you remember what rule we're taking advantage of? So let, let's write it down again, because I want to make sure this is going to be important. So remember what the rule was. Uh, the rule that we're using here, and which we used in all of these, was if you have something locked to the base A of something, then the base and the log cancel each other. Why couldn't you do this here is because, as you all notice rightfully, is there's a minus 1 in front of it here. Now what you can do is notice in the rule, there is nothing in front of the log here. Right? So what I kind of want to hit home here is that those rules that I gave you, you can use them as templates. In order for you to actually apply a rule, the problem you're looking at has to fit on top of the rule exactly. And if you have something in a position that is not in the quoted rule, you cannot apply the rule. You have to do something first, right? That's the idea. So because there was a negative one here, it was not yet valid to apply this rule. I had to get rid of the thing that was here because according to the rule, nothing should be there. You understand what I'm saying? Um, and in the same way, if you had something like that, you can't cancel the ln and the e either, right? Why? Because here, the log is in the power. Here, the log is right beside it. It's multiplying. This does not fit on top of that. So this, you couldn't cancel either. It's very important that positionally, like it's literally a template. Yeah, this is the big number, and that's the small number in the power. If you look at this and this, two boxes beside each other, one box to the top right corner of the other box, right? Literally the positions of everything, just like a template, right? So the rules are going to tell you everything that's legal, and you follow them exactly. If anything is out of position, you have to first use algebra or laws of exponents or something to manipulate it into the right position before you can apply the rule, right? I have a lot of people try to apply rules before it's valid to apply them. Not that the rule is wrong, but they're applying them in the wrong situations. I want to make sure that you guys aren't doing that. So, but it's good. Uh, most people did not fall for the trap and did it correctly. But just in case someone who didn't speak out would have done something like this, I want you to know it's wrong and know why it's wrong. Um, so, that being said, you can probably move through this quickly. and do the others. So, 1B, how do you simplify E to the ln of ln of E Q? Yeah? So, with the Q, you create in front of the ln in the parentheses? And then the um, ln and then the E in the parentheses kind of cancel each other out? This one? Yeah. Okay. And then it becomes E ln to the power of 3 and using the rule. Well, E ln of 3. Yeah. And using the rule that you said, 
it would be closer. That's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it is to just realize that I could have canceled at this point and got e to the ln of 3 and cancel here and get 3 again. And again, if I'm here, I could have canceled this right away, get this, then this will cancel and get 3. Tons of legal ways to actually do this. At every given step, I'm using the same rule, but I'm using it in a different position. You can use it anywhere you want. So you can do any, any of these would be fine. Um, whichever way you saw first is fine. You don't have to do it in one particular way. Just make sure whatever way you're doing it is legal. Two, how do you expand this law? Expand them before you do the calculus. 
Okay. That, ju that should just be something that you have in mind. Um, so problem. Uh, so here, let's combine log to base 2 of x minus log to base 2 of x squared plus 5 log to base 2 of x. How do you do this one? They just add them, right? Because it's common terms. We have 1 log x minus 2 log x's plus 5 log x's, right? It's like 1 apple minus 2 apples plus 5 apples, right? So 1 minus 2, you get minus 1 of them plus that, you get 4 log to the base 2 of x. So we have that. Um, another way you could have done this is can you use the laws of logarithm that tells you how to subtract and add logs? Subtraction means you divide inside the logs, so that's x over x squared, right? Notice that I didn't write two logarithms, I only write one logarithm and I, the division happened inside the logarithm. That's another common mistake that I see since we have time. Plus 5 logs base to x. At this point, you can simplify this a little bit. That's log to the base 2, 1 over x. Plus, if I'm using the rule to combine logs again, I'd probably move this up. So now I can use the addition of logs. Now if I'm adding two logs, how does, what's the result now? You multiply. So it's log to the base 2 of 1 over x times x to the fifth. Now it comes to x to the fourth. So you end up with log to the base 2 of x to the fourth. And of course, there's a rule that says I can bring this 4 down. Right? So that's going to be log to the base 4 log to the base 2 of x. Right? Again, several ways you can do this problem. Just make sure any way you do it is legal. Yes? Does it matter if you have solution No. There are several ways you can do the problem. Make sure what you're doing is legal. Yes? I actually have a question on that previous problem. Yeah. Yes. So you see where it says minus um, 3 ln x plus 1, the bottom yeah. one? The bottom one. Yeah. Does it matter if we grow, um, like we did minus ln x before the minus 3 ln x plus 1? No. It doesn't matter, right? No. Now, why would you need this? Combining logs. calculus and you combine things into one big log and then you start to do calculus on it, you are making your life way harder than it has to be. Um, you want to expand when you're doing calculus. If you're in a situation where there's an equation with a logarithm that you want to solve, no calculus at all, you just want to solve for x, combining is what you're going to want to do. So it's important that you know both how to expand logarithms and how to contract logarithms because you use them in different situations. inside a logarithm, they'll cancel each other. So knowing that, what you can do is you can plug both sides 
into an LN. Both of them are equal, we're going to get the same thing when we plug in uh, them into the LN. Now on this side, the LN and E will cancel and we will have X and over here we have LN. You can also notice that this follows, so just to ins insert uh, terminology here. Um, so when you do this process like I just did, plug both in the LN, sometimes technically it's not correct, but it's um, colloquium, I guess. Uh, you say you LN both sides. Or you say you log both sides. So for, I'm working on a problem, I say, oh, you just log both sides, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I did this. Um, another way you could also no notice here, or notice this follows directly from the definition. This means it's the log law number one you'll realize that log, the log, log, law number one tells you directly that an equation like this and an equation like that are equivalent. You have log to the base A of B equals C, then it's equivalent to saying A raised to C equals B. Right? So you can actually think of this in terms of law one. But it's a very common way to think of, oh, just plug both into the LN, because you know that logs and exponentials are inverses of each other, and so we can use one to cancel the other. So that's a very natural way to actually think about it. So that equation wasn't bad, you can solve it in one step. Uh, let's look at the other equation. Uh, ln x equals 7. Again, not a bad one. How do you do this one? This is using the rule one here. Uh, so we know that log to the base a of b equals c is the same as saying a raised to the c equals b. So here you have base e. This is like your a in this side. So that thing becomes the base over here. c was the guy on the other side of the equal sign. So that goes into the power. So it's e to the seventh. And the b that was beside the log goes to the other side of the equation. That's your x. So you can actually use law 1 here. Another common way to look at this problem is again using the exponential to cancel the logarithm. You have ln of x equals 7. The same way you can plug both sides into a log, you can actually plug both sides into the exponential. So you just imagine plugging both of these into the power of the exponential. On this side, that would cancel. You get x. And on that side, you'd be left with b to the seventh. Now, whenever you do this process, again, not technically correct to say this, but it's what you might say. You say we e both sides. Right? What does it mean to e both sides? Well, it means take each side, plug it into the power of e uh, exponential. And that allows to cancel things. So we can use logs to cancel exponentials. We can use exponentials to cancel logarithms. They're inverse functions, so we can do this. So sometimes we're going to solve equations, and you can say, oh, just log both sides, or just e both sides. And you'll know what I mean when I say that. Uh, let's do another one. Right. So, so L and E cancel. 
is uh, some of the components of the X, for example, 4, uh, by subtracting 5 from both sides, and then divided by negative 3. Um, notice that the ln4 and the 5 are separate. It's not like the, you can't subtract the 5 from the 4. Um, and then, yeah, it's just an algebra problem at this point. Isolate the x is what we're doing, so we're going to divide both sides by negative 3. So that will be your answer. Or you can rewrite it as something like 5 minus ln4 all over 3. You cannot go inside a logarithm and mess with it from something outside, other than in the way that the rule moves the power, so be aware of that. Don't divide the 3 into this 4, don't subtract the 5 from the 4. Once something is inside a log, it's, it's protected. On the left, the only thing that can affect this is something in front that you can move to the power. You can't mess with it otherwise. Question? Yes? Break it up. Like if you wanted to break it up into fractions. You can. So you could write this as 5 over 3 minus ln of 4 over 3. That's also fine. Um, I don't see much benefit at this point, but that it wouldn't be wrong. <coughs> so any of these answers would be fine. Okay, so for this one, what do we want to do here? Yeah. Uh, first, because uh, there's an addition sign, we'll just uh, multiply log of x to the parentheses x minus 3. Right. Uh, then, okay, okay, so. To apply that rule, again, remember, this is just an equation. Whenever you want to solve an equation, you want to start combining all the logarithms. Group all the logarithms, get them into one big logarithm. Okay, now what? Um, then I distributed it. Then we did what? Oh, yeah. Oh, inside here? Uh, first, uh, oh, yeah, no, first I uh, used uh, law 1 because I assumed that the base was 10. Right, so, so for us that means base 10. So I did uh, 10 to the 1 power equals um, 10, yeah, x minus 3. And then I distributed x, x minus 3. Yeah. And How do you solve that? And then I subtracted 10 on both sides. It to uh, x minus 5, x plus 2. So factor. Yeah. And, and x plus 2. Um, and so the answers would be. Uh, well, let's continue over here.
clean up today. Oh, I actually skipped one. That was actually E. This was E. Let's do D. So we have here ln of 2x plus 1 equals 2 minus ln of x. Okay, how are we going to do this one? Anyone, just go. So now we're done with the preliminaries. 
So I'm going to be using exponentials and logarithms uh, to prove some things for you later on. That's why I want to make sure that everyone's kind of solid with them and how they work.
So you pretty much know the math. Uh, I want to know how fast this is moving. Okay. Like, how do you answer a question like that? It seems very general, very vague. What thing? Anything. I want to know how fast anything is moving. Right? That's, that's the rate problem, right? So it's a very difficult problem, but it's also a very important problem. And that was one of the problems that we needed to be able to solve, figuring out how fast things are moving. Um, the area problem was another important problem. And that was pretty much figuring out how much space something takes up, is basically the idea. Okay? So, and that, again, is something that very early on we needed to know how to do. Uh, and the example I always give is, like, imagine you're, you own a plot of land, and you know you're being charged property taxes. Right? And you want to know, are the taxes fair? Like, how do you know how much land I actually own? Now, if you, your, your plot of land is an exact rectangle, that's fine. But what if your plot of land had this weird, irregular shape? That was your plot of land. How many acres is that for you? Right? If you could, like, trace out your land, how do you know how much land you actually have? Right? How do you know the government isn't overcharging your property taxes? Or how do you know I should be selling if they're undercharging? Right? How do you know how much space or area something takes up? And again, a very vague question is like, I want to know how much space anything takes up. Right? That's kind of the, the way the question is posed. Figuring out how much space something takes up. Some irregular shape that it's not easy for you to have some formula. It's not a, like a circle or a rectangle or a trapezoid or a thing that have nice formulas for it. Just some irregular shape. We want to know how much space something takes up. This is called the area problem. I want to know how fast things are moving, I want to know how much space they take up. This is the rate and the area problem. And these are the two problems that calculus solves. And how does calculus solve these two problems? Well, with derivatives and inverse. It turns out the derivative solves this problem. And the integral solves this problem. So what is calculus? It's the study of how fast things change and how much space they take up. These are very important things to know. The derivative helps us figure out how fast things are moving. The integral helps us figure out how much space something takes up. That's kind of where it all started. It's really developed into a whole other beast entirely. And we have all sorts of applications that beforehand we just never imagined that we would have had. But the logical progression of things kind of, hey, this thing is pretty useful other than just answering these two basic problems. We can talk about a lot of other things as well. Now, on one hand, you might think these two things are very different. Figuring out the speed of something versus how much space some plot of land is. And for a long time, for millennia in fact, these two questions were studied separately. And People had their own little tools over here to figure out how fast something is moving, and people had their own little tools over here to figure out how much space they takes up. And we figured out these problems like a long time ago, like 300 BC. We actually knew how to solve these problems. But when Newton came along and Leibniz came along, and Newton's uh, professor, they realized something that was very interesting. It turns out that these two things are actually the same problem. They're actually two sides of the same coin. These two things are connected. There's a bridge that connects these two things that really makes studying one is equivalent to studying the other. Right? It's kind of like an exponential and log idea. Well, I know about this situation. I can automatically figure out what's going on over here. And it would seem like these two things are completely different questions, but they're actually the same question. It's just they're attacked from different angles. And the way that we now know this is called the fundamental theorem of calculus. So these are two important questions that we needed to answer. We figured out ways to answer them individually. But around 1700, we realized it was actually the same problem. If I know one, I kind of can figure out the other one. And the theorem that tells us that important fact is called the fundamental theorem of calculus. And this is why calculus class exists. This is why we study the way we study it now. It's a lot uh, to do with that work done by Newton and Leibniz in the late 1600s, early 1700s, around there. And 
it really ties everything together, puts it in one little neat theory where we can talk about differential calculus, it's called. So what, what the part of calculus that deals with this is called differential calculus. And uh, the part of calculus that deals with the area problem, this is called integral calculus. But it turns out they're two sides of the same coin. I can know a lot about one by studying the other one. And I know precisely how these two things are connected. It's connected by this theorem. And this is going to be one of the last theorems we cover in the semester. Maybe about two thirds through the semester we'll see this guy. And, but most of our time is going to be spent on derivatives, the differential calculus portion, which is going to kind of culminate with the fundamental theorem of calculus which is then going to allow us to study the area problem. And we're going to study that for a little bit before the class ends. And in Calc 2, you'll pick up from where we're leaving off here with studying more about integrals. So that's kind of the overview. This is what calculus is, why it's important. And we'll realize some other reasons why it's important as we move along. But that's kind of the basic idea. That's what we're doing here. Right? So this is the context that I wanted to lay out for you guys. So, at any given time, you should know that when we're talking about derivatives, ultimately, we can think about some sort of rate of change that is called. We're talking about integrals. Ultimately, there's some sort of area, but there's, there are many applications. So that's where, uh, that's where we're going. And as I said here, it all starts with the idea of a limit. And that's going to be our first topic. So let's do limits. What is a limit? How do these things work? Why are they important? How do they allow us to solve the rate problem and the area problem? Well, let's see. Limits. Now, your textbook breaks up the study of limits into many different sections. I'm kind of going to do all of it at once, just kind of continuously, just go through all the sections here. Um, let's start with the definition. What is a limit? Now I'm going to start with uh, a fuzzy definition first. Meaning, it's the more intuitive idea, though it's not technically precise. We'll look at the technically precise definition later on. But basically, as an idea, here's what a limit is. Uh, we say the limit as x approaches a of the function f of x is l and we write uh, this symbol or this set of symbols So this is a phrase that we're using. So this thing is read, the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l. Right? That's how I would say it in words. Okay? What does that mean? What does it mean to say that? If as x gets close to a, Y will get close to a, well, the Y value, I mean, so Y equals f of x, will get close to a unique value, L. So that's what it means. And again, this is kind of what I was talking about. It's talking about inching close towards something. I do want to emphasize the word close, which is why I underlined the it does not mean you actually ever achieve certain positions. 
your x might never actually get to position A, your y value might never actually get to position L, but that's not important to us. We just care about we're able to inch closer and closer and closer to those positions, um, as close as we want, in fact. Um, that's kind of the fuzzy, intuitive definition. Let's actually see how this is applied. Let's look at some examples. Look at that statement. What is the limit as x approaches 2 of this function? 3x minus 1. Now, I want you to be careful here um, and don't rush into things. I want us to kind of explore this particular idea. And it might seem like why go through all the trouble in this situation, but uh, uh, there's a reason why we want to do this. So here's what is actually happening. One, let's actually explore this with a picture. What does 3x minus 1 look like? It's a straight line, right? Positive slope, these are things, right? So I actually about thought that sketching lines on quiz 1, you need to know how to sketch things. Graphing is going to be very, very important. In fact, in our syllabus, there's, a, there's an entire section devoted to nothing but graphing things in more detail. So you have to know how to graph them in basic detail before you can sort of tweak that more individually. So this will pass through minus 1. Um, what's it going to pass through here? that though everything is zo zooming in on. Do you see that? 
As your x is getting close to 2, you're watching your y values, and your y values are all getting close to something. Now, the goal is for you to figure out what is that something, right? That is the answer to the question, right? So when someone says, what is the limit? They mean, let your x inch closer and closer to 2, and then tell me what the y value inches closer to, right? That's the idea. So, uh, what do you think the number is that it's inching closer to? Yeah? Makes sense that it's going to be 5. Now, in this case, it's, that's pretty easy because I can actually just plug in 2 here and see that 5 is going to be the answer, right? I can be at 2, right? So there's no, nothing wrong with just, I know the answer is going to be 5. I can't get closer to 2 than actually being 2 itself, and so 5 would be the answer here. And so we would say here that the limit as x approaches 2 of 3x minus 1 equals 5. So someone can make that statement, and this is what they mean. When my x values are getting closest, closer and closer and closer to 2, my y values will get closer and closer and closer to 5. Okay? Let's look at another example. Let's get close to 2 again. But this time, this is going to be my function. What is the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 4 divided by x minus 2? Sometimes, right? 
Now, how would you reduce the fraction x squared minus 4 over x minus 2? Factor out the top. Factor out the top. x minus 2 times x plus 2. You can then cancel these. And we get that. So one thing you can notice is that the function is undefined at 2, but at every other location, the function will behave like the straight line y equals x plus 2, which means this function looks like x plus 2, which again is a straight line we're doing like that, passing through 2. The only difference is at the location 2, there is a hole, right? We can't actually be at that particular position. But now we can actually play the same game, okay? Now I know I can't get to the 2, but a limit doesn't care about being at the 2. The limit cares about inching closer and closer to 2. So yes, there's a hole in my graph, but I'm never actually going to get there. Right? So I'm going to play that game. Okay, it is closer and closer and closer and closer to 2. That means I'm on this line moving up and up and up towards the hole, which means my y values, if I'm tracking them, they're moving up and up and up and up towards something. Right? And then I can play that other game over here. Okay, if I inch closer and closer and closer and closer to 2 from this direction, then that means I'm on the function inching down and down and down to that. Which means if I track in my y values, they're actually moving down and down and down and down. And they're approaching the same location. And so now when someone asks you, what is this limit? What they're asking you is, what is that location that think the y value is getting closer and closer and closer to? And what do you think is going to get closer and closer and closer to? Four. Four. Well, now because we kind of know that this is x plus 2, so we're always plugging in x plus 2 along these points. So this will be approaching whatever the value of x plus 2 would have been had we been able to plug in 2. Well, if you plug in 2 here, you get 4. And so 4 is the answer here, and that makes this the answer here. Questions on that? Let's do another example. What does that picture look like? I know 
was the piece last time, but the picture, what is it? How would I sketch it? So, figure that two is a straight line. Okay, uh, how do I know how to draw that straight line? So, I identified two on this picture. Okay, what do I do now? So, over here, I'm drawing one straight line. How do I figure out? Okay, and then do what? Two points. Okay, so tell me what to do. So you, you plug it in 4, and you get 13. And then? You use 10? Why not use 2? Yeah, so you just put an open circle, right? You can just put a hole. If I plug in 2 here, what would I get? 7. Right. And now that's what I would have done. You don't even need to test it on the point because you should have a pretty good idea in your head of what 3x plus 1 looks like, right? It's just a straight line moving up. So I'm just going to put a hole here at position where the y value is 7 and just do that. Right? Don't need to be exactly accurate here. And now what do you do here? What is that going to look like? Yeah. Yeah. So at two, what's this going to be? Huh? It'll be zero, right? So we're going to be at this position, and now how do we graph the left? It's a parabola, right? Um, what was it? Right. It's a parabola x squared shifted to the right by two units. Uh, what's going to be the y-intercept? Hmm? Four. Right, so it's actually going to be a little bit below seven, but we're thinking of a parabola, so it's going to curve like that. It's going to pass through. Okay, so that's the picture we're working with. So now let's actually do, uh, say, the same game. We can apply this idea that we're using. Inching closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to 2. I'm looking at what's happening to my function. And it seems here that my y values are moving down towards this location. Right? Come over here. Moving closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to 2. Now I'm looking at my y values and my x's. These values now, obviously, they're going to be on here. So they're moving closer and closer and closer and closer. They're moving on here at that point. If I track what the actual y values are doing, they're going to move down and down and down and down and down to this location. Right? So knowing that, uh, so do we know what these locations are? This, this red location is what? You can kind of see there, it's like a 7. And this location is 0. So what is the limit? Limit from the left doesn't equal to the limit from the right. Now you remember that definition I gave you. I told you that there was a unique y value that we cared about. This is approaching two separate y values. So in this case, we would say that the limit does not exist. Uh, we write d n e. So what that means is does not exist. It's kind of like saying the limit is undefined, but we don't use the phrase undefined. We say does not exist. That's how it works. Stands for does not exist. And the why why it does not exist. The y value. does not approach a unique number. Okay.
do a quiz on uh, pretty much everything you did since. Yes. Yeah.